Welcome to the Multifamily Investor Nation podcast sponsored by CoStar. I'm your host, Dan Hanford, and with us today is Justin Brennan with the Brennan Poli Group. Justin, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Well, looking forward to diving into this deal that you have in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. It was acquired in, just in, in 2019 uh, as a C, C minus asset that you guys are going to be bringing up to a solid B. And we're going to talk about that in that process you're going to be going through. 31 units called the Brookside Apartments. And before we dive into that, Justin, give us a little bit of a background about yourself and where you are right now in the multifamily space. Uh, you know, born and raised uh, in San Diego. Um, Third generation kind of builder developer, you know, learned from my dad and my 91 year old grandma, you know, all about the multifamily apartment space, really ground up construction is where my, my, my background is in, uh, my licensed general contractor and kind of came up through that space of land planning, ground up construction of multifamily condos, apartments, et cetera. And uh, then the financial crisis hit, our wonderful financial crisis of 2008 that pretty much wiped a lot of people out, consolidated a lot of my dad's businesses at that time. But it lended its way for me becoming an asset manager uh, for a third party asset management firm here in San Diego that handled a lot of foreclosures nationwide for a lot of the major banking institutions. So that kind of got my feet wet on how to properly asset manage like around the country where you don't need to be local with the assets. So that was a huge learning experience, which I loved. And then jumped into the broker realtor world and doing the residential sales side along the coast in San Diego, but then always having that itch to get back into the multifamily. And I've kind of used the sales side of things as a realtor as a catalyst to get money and then go find deals and put deals together, um, both locally in San Diego, but now we're starting to syndicate around the country. Well, let's just jump right into this deal that we have here, the 31 units out of Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, built in 1976 called the Brookside Apartment. So talk to us first about how you ended up finding this deal. You know, this one was a bit unique. We had just closed on 27 units previous to this in the same general area of Kansas City and not really knowing much about Kansas City until probably the early part of last year, 2019. But we located it through both uh, our, our broker on the ground, because that's part of the infrastructure we put in place in each of the markets we go into, broker local, as well as the, uh, the property manager that we had hired on our 27 unit, ended up being a general partner with us on this new 31 unit, because he liked it so much and we liked it. So we ended up putting a deal together along with our investor group, and away we go. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up because I try to talk to people about that all the time that, you know, a lot of times we think brokers, off market, direct to seller or loop net. But one of the missing pieces is really the property management companies that are yeah. out there because they're the ones that are in contact with these owners all the time. So there is no skip tracing involved. It's really just building relationships with these, with these property management companies to say, hey, do you know of any of your owners that might be in a position to possibly sell their assets? And it sure. sounds like you might have found a great deal here. Yeah, and they know a lot of things ahead of time, as you just mentioned, between that and the, and the brokers on the ground. Um, you know, they're going to have their ear to it and be able to know something's coming up for sure. So was this one completely off market? Uh, it was initially. <laughs> and then like the owner, you know, it was a great story because the owners, you know, had owned it, built the property originally from the 1970s, had owned it all the way wow. since. Really focused in the senior housing uh sector and was ready to kind of move on from it and consolidate his assets and portfolio. And it just, you know, we barely allowed this thing on the market for 12 hours before the LOI went in and we locked it up and really got a great price per unit on the deal. Uh, whereby the upside is just having the property managers on the ground, as well as our brokers and my knowledge of it, since I'd gotten there, we knew that the, uh, this thing was way under market rents currently. Mm -hmm. um, but then doing the rehab and remodeling that we're doing, um, we're going to be able to boost those quite a bit. So what did you end up acquiring this one for? Uh, 53,000 a door. And uh, most of the uh, B class properties in that area are selling right around 100 to 110 a door right now. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be putting about 11 to 13,000 a unit that includes a little bit of exterior uh, deferred maintenance, you know, so that's that portion of it, but most of it's going to be upgrades on the interior parts of the units. And what was that price again? Uh, 53,000 a door. So about a million, uh, five, six, five um, for the units. Okay. Um, renovation costs per door. 
Um, we've budgeted 13,000 a door, uh, about 2000 a door is going to be kind of deferred maintenance and then the rest of its upgrades. Okay. So 12,000 or 11,000 interior, 2000 out exterior on per door. Right. Price. On deferred maintenance stuff. Yep. That's yeah. right. Deferred maintenance. Okay. And what, how many rounds of offers did you go back and forth before your offer was accepted on this one? Uh, two. It was actually pretty quick. Okay. Pretty so quick. What, what was your original offer on this one and how much did you have to go up? We were at a million five twenty five initially. Um, and then they came back obviously higher. We went back pretty quickly and then locked it in at a million five, six, five. Okay. And did you have to put any, well, wait, before I do that, uh, well, yeah. Did you have to put any earnest money deposit up on this one and did it go hard day one or did it just the typical after due diligence? Yeah, you got the due diligence period. Uh, I believe we'd set in 25,000, which went up initially. Um, and I think that got increased by another 15 or 20,000 uh, after due diligence. Um, and then that due diligence period was 60 days. Um, that included both inspections as well as the financing side of it. Okay. And after the due diligence period, you had another 30 days to close? Just about. Yep. There's a total of, I think it's just short of 90 days start okay. to finish. Okay. And did you have to opt for any extensions on it or anything? It's a great question. I don't, I don't think, I think we did maybe a week um, cause we were dealing with the roof when we did our roof inspections and stuff. We had to negotiate some stuff once that came back. Um, but for the most part, it was pretty dead on. You know, we had the financing lined up with a uh, bank locally on this particular deal where uh, I think it's a seven year, excuse me, a five year uh, note, uh, two years IO interest only. And then it goes to principal and interest. So the goal with this one in particular is to go ahead and do the rehab over the next you know, 24 months or less mm -hmm. and reset it, refinance it, and then uh, maybe get more of a permanent type loan on it at that point and mm -hmm. do some refi for getting some capital back out for the investors potentially. So let's talk about the renovations here. We got 12, uh, 11,000 per door on the interior for renovations. Yep. What do you, what do you, what's your plan for the interior renovations? Because obviously you mentioned earlier on that we're going to take this C, C minus asset and bring it all the way up to a solid B. Yep. So obviously to take, do it, spending 11,000 a door, it, it could possibly do that. So what's, what's mm -hmm. your plan there on the interiors for renovations? Um, well, washers and dryers and all the units, stackables, because uh, that's going to help us boost the rents uh, nicely. All of them are original condition. So if you can imagine that 1970s, you know, now we're going to be putting the, the, you know, the plank vinyl flooring down, new kitchen cabinets, um, new appliances, backsplash in the kitchens, uh, redo the bathrooms on the cabinets as well as countertops, both for kitchens and baths, and then repaint kind of that, with that soft gray that everybody sees and kind of modernizing the unit in general. And we've already gotten through a couple of them now. And now we have our calendar set for 2020 to start turning, you know, two to three a month, but closer to two months uh, to get the, the building turned over, hopefully, you know, this year and early next. So on the washer dryers, you chose stackables. Was that because of space requirements or? It is. Yeah, because of space. I mean, that's always the, the fun logistics when you're dealing with smaller one and two bedroom units trying to find that closet, but then logistically with plumbing, drains, electrical, making sure that all works. Uh, so you're not spending a grip of money trying to set up a washer dryer. So on the property right now, are there, is there like a laundry room already? Uh, they do. They have, uh, there's uh, three buildings and each of them has its own little small coin operated laundry systems that generate a little bit of, you know, other income. Um, but you know, with the new laundries going in the units, that's going to boost rents enough to offset that. And then we'll should, probably be able to start implementing a rubs program as we get further down the line to get some of that kind of water fee stuff back a little bit over time. So what's your plan for the, for the space right now that you're going to be removing the coin laundry in? Um, we have not figured that out right now. It's storage. Okay. <laughs> That's a good, okay. good question. Um, maybe, you know, some people were joking, we should turn it into uh, a, a pet, washing station or a pet mm, washing room where yep. people can bring their pets in, clean them, groom them, do all that stuff. And like, I was like, that's not a bad idea. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not a bad idea. I don't know on that size of a property, you'd want to have three of them. Right. I mean, because you'd have one in each room. Yep. Maybe you have one on the centralized building and then in the extra and the other two, you maybe convert it to, you know, rentable storage space or maybe yep. even to some sort of a, like a package locker room instead of like a package locker, you know, system. Those are a little more expensive. Sure. 
by yeah, a couple thousand Yeah, each unit does have a locker unit. space, which is nice. Uh, within this kind of corridor where the laundries are at, it's outside the area, but it's the same area, um, which is nice for each one of the units. You could expand on those and make them a little larger or, like you mentioned, maybe charge for some certain services to boost mm-hmm. the revenue. Yeah, no, that's great. That's a good idea. Um, and from the the rub system right now, right now are, is are they are they, are they not billing back or I mean, before? I guess right They're now no you bill. guys own it, but before you guys took it over, were they actually billing for water at all? No, no, they're to the the income was straight rents as well as you know late fees, basic stuff like that, and then um, the laundry income. Sounds like the, like a typical you know original owner developer holding on to it. It's cash flowing nicely for them. They're not really trying to maximize the value, and it's a great, great acquisition yeah, for I mean, you. The, it's, it's amazing um, because of all the tenants. I mean, he kept some tenants in there for like 20 years. Wow. And they're really great people. So, of course, we're being tactical with them and doing things the right way from a PR standpoint because <laughs> most of these folks are older, and we certainly don't want to be on the 5 o'clock news trying to boot a bunch of, you know, mature folks out. Uh, so we've kind of worked with them, shown them what we're doing, trying to encourage them along if they want to, if they can afford to move into the new units at the new pricing and stuff. So we found about six or seven of uh, the current tenants that are really excited and do have the ability to take on the new rental amounts. And so we're going to be moving them from their current unrenovated unit into a new unit. And that's going to save us on marketing time speed, as you know, for that turnover factor. Um, and we'll see if we can grab a few more. So what are the uh, rents on the property before the, on the classic units? I'll say uh, six to 700 a month, six right around 600 for the one bedrooms, like seven to seven twenty five on the twos. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and that's going to go up. So they're going to be around. Uh, we just renovated um, a one bedroom, just rented it at 900. And that's for a one bedroom. Mm-hmm. And then the twos are going to be about a, just under 1100 when it gets reset. Wow. That's pretty, pretty significant. They were way under market. Like I said, I was joking with you before we started here, but I, I feel like this was a rare gem just given the situation and everything. Sure. So question here, uh, taking something from a C to a B, especially a C minus and yep. C to a, to a solid B, which is kind of like a middle of the road B, not a B minus, not a B plus, but kind of in the middle there can be a bit challenging. And I'm wondering if you have faced that yet. Uh, And if not, to give you kind of some word of caution with that, because what I have seen from doing these interviews, as well as some of my own experience with assets that we have acquired from our own group, that taking it from a C to a B is a lot more challenging than it actually sounds, because one of the best ways to do it is to empty the entire building and actually renovate all the units and then lease it up from there. Because sure. residences who are typically living in a C-class property aren't necessarily wanting to live next to or vice versa. The Bs aren't usually wanting to you know, co-mingle with the C-class properties. And so that's kind of been one of the challenges that I've seen in our own properties, but also in other, other guests we've had on the, on, the, on the show as well. Have you yeah. kind of thought about that or trying to do something to kind of mitigate that, that risk? Yeah, great question. Um, I think because of the current tenant pool and the way the building was designed and set up being it's I mean, most of the folks are probably north of 70 years of age. Mm-hmm. So the new tenant pool that's probably coming in is more of that quote unquote, you know, millennial generation and given the Brookside and the Brookside neighborhood there, it definitely lends itself to that kind of fun, vibey environment. Um, so, you know, we haven't experienced too much of that pushback yet with, you know, we have now three units that have been, you know, turned and new tenants coming in and stuff. So that hasn't affected it quite yet. The exterior of the building is actually in really good shape. That's good. So there's not a ton of money that needs to go into that aspect of it, which was great. Uh, it's more of just the interior and it's all mostly cosmetic, right? Where you're doing floors, paint, um, kitchens, baths, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So during the due diligence process, what kind of issues did you see or did you, did you did actually come up during that process? Uh, the roof, you know, so you know, in terms of the inspections, we have full blown inspections of all the interior units, uh, walk them, you know, make notes on everything, pictures, videos. We, you know, scope the sewer, scope the drain systems, uh, the roof system, had a roofing inspector come out. So that was one of the big ticket items that we got some credits on through the escrow um, because they did have certain sectors of the roof that were deteriorated to a point where, look, it's going to need to get replaced at some point. 
So we were able to work that into the escrow. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, a lot of the main, um, you know, whether it's water heaters, HVAC systems, a lot of the major component items were in pretty fair condition, uh, surprisingly. Um, and the owner had actually done a good job at making some CapEx improvements over the, you know, the term of the of moaning it to where you didn't have these 20 year old HVAC units and water heaters and everything busting up. So what kind what did you do for property management on here? Because obviously having a smaller unit size, no on site, I'm assuming. Correct. So you have third party. Um, what, yep. what did you do for, for the third party? Obviously, I guess one of your GPs is kind of, you know, in, in the deal as well. So I'm sure you're using yeah. them for the property management. So that's when you know you got a good deal when your uh, when your property manager who does about fifteen hundred or almost two thousand doors in the Kansas City area, they see it as like oh, oh geez this is a, a good opportunity and they jump in. They wanted to be a GP. They want to have a little bit more control along with us. So we were like we were all in on it because we know they're clearly vested in it the same way we are, and they're going to be making sure that we're keeping expenses low, keeping the revenues pushing, and moving this building in the right direction. So that's with North Terrace. Uh, they're local in Kansas City. Great little firm that's growing and growing and, you know, the owner's fantastic, you know, my age, probably your age too, and, um, you know, growing a business there and they own their own units as well as manage. So I want to ask you about your process for uh, the smaller units and what your property management company does from a touring standpoint, because I've seen it done a couple of different ways, but I'd like to know kind of what your you know, system and processes for, you know, a resident finds, you know, an ad or whatever, and kind of knows that there's a space available. They pick up the phone, they call, or they go to the website, you find out they want to tour it. What happens at that point? Yeah. So they have a whole leasing uh, marketing department within North Terrace, you know, that kind of initially, and this is something they actually worked on over the last year where they were getting all these leads coming in, right? But you need a full-time person if you get enough of them and you're managing enough doors to make sure that you're responding and following up and then setting the tours and stuff. So uh, I know there's some automated systems that allow for tours of properties. Uh, ours has been more manual, you know, to where they're either texting or getting texts. So they're doing that as well as the calling from the signage as well as online. They use Sh uh, Show Mojo, and that allows the leads to filter in and then they'll set the appointments for the viewing. So they're doing a tour. They're actually doing it in person, walking yes. them in, opening the key, actually showing them the unit. Yeah. And I know there's some, I've seen some automated systems that have been coming out to allow that, you know, tenant to show up, walk in the unit and take a look at it and kind of expedite that process. We haven't gotten there quite yet, but I've seen that as an option. Well, I will say I'm not a big fan of the automated process. So yeah. I think that there is definitely an element of sales when it comes yep. to leasing and talking up the property, talking up the Telling units the story. and- yeah. yeah. And they're telling them the whole story. It's just like when you go to buy a house, you got to have that agent with you that tells you the whole story about the house or it doesn't usually sell as well. So um, yeah. that's why I was just curious to kind of see what you guys do. Was it more of a manual or an auto process and kind of what the experience has been like? Yeah. My background in the residential sales business, I mean, I, I come from a marketing perspective. So, you know, I'll go online and just double check to see how all the properties are being positioned I'll even update the property manager if, you know, cause a lot of times they, they push it from their, their rent manager system or whatever their main core system is. And then it syndicates out. Right. Well, sometimes depending on how they syndicate to the large portals like Zillow apartments.com apartment list, et cetera, it may not position itself as well if it's being syndicated. So then sometimes they'll manually go into that listing and make sure it's really showing with the right photos and stuff and mm -hmm. the descriptions and everything. So that way, you know, it's like anything. People want to see that first one or two photos and that drives them in. All right. No, I think that's a, that's a crucial piece. I think a lot of people miss because that's one of the things that, you know, my, I do quite a bit as well is, you know, I'm on these asset management calls and I'm pulling up apartments.com. I'm like, listen, you can't show the clubhouse as the first photo. It's got to be the kitchen. They're just yep. a newly renovated kitchen, you know, right. and, you know, put the pool towards the back, you know, and don't put the clubhouse. <laughs> Nobody really cares about the clubhouse as much, you know? No, you hit the nail right on the, you hit it. And that's, um, and so I do a little bit of the micromanaging a little bit on that, but that's the asset management side, right? Of, yeah. of our job is to kind of manage the managers. So, yeah. So uh, what's the hold period on this one? Uh, five to seven years. Five to seven years and full cycle exit. You, you bought this thing for 53, you're putting in uh, 13, a door. So all in, you're at like 65. 66 a door. Yep. What's the potential exit price when you sell this thing in five to seven years? 
You know, the potential is probably to, uh, I, I've underwritten it at a six and a half, seven cap mm -hmm. uh, on the exit and right around about 110 a door, um, which is actually what's trading today. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see kind of where the markets trend and what happens as we all know, we can't control a lot of that sometimes. Sure. Well, I think you got a lot of extra room in there for error when it comes yeah. up to that, to that kind of a price. On, so, on this particular deal. Yeah. A couple of the other ones are a little tighter, but yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, I know we talked a little bit about the finance here and you kind of touched on it a little bit earlier. Let's dive a little bit deeper in that and discuss again, kind of what you did from a financing perspective on this one. Cause it sounds like you did, a, you used a community bank. Yeah, local bank there, uh, Core First in Kansas City that uh, both our property manager had a great relationship with, has done some other deals with them. They, what they'll do is they'll provide, um, you know, renovation costs within their loan, almost kind of like a line of credit on top of the, the principal amount that you can draw from right over the course of the next two years. And it limits the amount of equity we have to bring in at the same token. Uh, and we're getting it at a great you know, interest rate. So it, it behooves us to, to do that. Um, and the good news is, that even though we bought it at a million five, six, five, before we even closed escrow, the appraisal was at a million seven. And that was as is. So we were capturing equity pretty, pretty quickly. No, that's great. That's great. What kind of interest rate did you get? Uh, we're just about four, about 4%. Four, I'll double check that. I think it was right around 4%. Yeah, that's, that's a great, that's a great, especially right now. Obviously, you know, right now it's gone down even lower than that because of the, the current environment that we're in and this uh, volatile up and down type it's free, of uh, It's free of money now, Dan. It's free. <laughs> I know. It's, it's great when it's free, right? Yeah. <laughs> They're going to start paying us to take the debt, right? That'll be yeah. nice. One of these days. All right. So uh, a couple other things here that I wanted to touch with you on is uh, structuring, how you structure the deal with your investors. So first off, how many investors do you have in this project? This one has uh, seven, in, uh, seven investors and two GPs. So Okay. So seven investors and two GPs. Now uh, with those seven investors, how did you structure the deal? I take that back. Three GPs. Three GPs. Three GPs. That doesn't matter. It's, I won't it's hold a nine, nine total. Okay. Yeah. So six, six passive investors in this project. Correct. Yep. Okay. And so how did you structure it with them? We have it set up because we brought in more of the equity as the GP in this particular deal. So it was a 60, 40 structure in terms of investors, class B get 60%. We get 40%. They get a preferred return on, you know, obviously first, and then we're splitting that 60, 40 on cash flows and distributions. And so awesome. who's in the class A position? Uh, that's the uh, investors in Warren oh, Class okay. B. Yeah. I think you might have. Did, I, did I switch that on you? I think you did. Okay. I was like, why would the investors yeah. be in Class B unless you had a dual structure? <laughs> but okay, just wanted to make sure. So the investors are in the and in the bottom of the capital stack, right next to the debt, and then and that are in that Class A position, and then the Correct. GP is in the Class B position. Yeah. My apologies. No, that's all right. I just wanted to just want to get clarification on that. Just to be sure. Yep. Um, and how much did you end up raising outside of? know your your own gp side of things about 400 grand so 400,000 yeah. and so, so each one of these yeah, we're going to big raise on this one yeah so each each one of these investors brought in what 50, uh, 50 to 100 grand 50 yeah. to 100 okay and how did you find these investors uh so we're doing 506 uh you know b offerings you know so we're it's family friends people we know most of them are accredited a couple unaccredited investors but that's why we use the 506 b uh, structure and it's all people we know. So we're not mass marketing any of these deals yet. They're small enough to where we can get around with our group. Mm -hmm. So you, I heard you say yet. You're going to be setting yourself up to do that? Yes. Yeah, we're going to be, obviously, like anybody, I mean, you graduate. And, you know, we have more lofty goals to get to, you know, first goal is 1,000 units by 2023. Second goal would be 10,000 units by 2027. Um, you know, as we kind of expand around the country and set up infrastructure, we'll move more into using both 506B as well as 506C type offerings. And what's your goal in regards to uh, asset classes moving forward? Um, I want to stay out of the A's. You know, my vision has always been to be, you know, take a C plus, you know, if you can turn it into anywhere in the B category you know, surrounded by A's, right? My goal is always to be Walmart, surrounded by Nordstrom, Neiman Marcus, and JCPenney, mm -hmm. right? Because then you're always full. And good markets, bad markets, whether, you know, the A's and bad markets have to move to B's, B's move to C's. So you always, Walmart's always full. 
Mm. They're full in good markets. They're full in bad markets. They're always full. So I prefer Walmart. <laughs> you know, that's just me. Uh, some people love the A-class. They don't want to deal with repairs and maintenance and all the other things. Uh, and there's good and bad to that. So, yeah, good, good answer there. And before we ask you my two final questions, can you think of anything, any issues that came up throughout the entire process that maybe we haven't touched on yet that you think would be valuable for the listener? Yeah, you know, you know, really doing proper due diligence. I mean, I think we always know that the, the value is in the purchase and doing proper due diligence. Don't you know, flinch on the inspections, pay the money, you know, three, four, five, 10 grand, whatever it is, because that money is going to save your, you know what, if you come up with something that you didn't realize, I mean, say you didn't scope the pipes, right? The drain lines, the main lines, and you find out one's about to explode. Well, that's very expensive to go fix that stuff. So things like that, drainage systems, but due diligence, proper due diligence, taking the time to walk the units and know really what you're buying. So that way you can understand that if you're saying, okay, we're going to put 10,000 a door, 15,000 a door, you know, as a good friend of mine, Jorge Abreu, I think you know him. Uh, he's with Elevate in, in, in Houston. Really sharp guy. But he understands the difference between deferred maintenance, right, and CapEx upgrades. And really differing between those when you're calculating your numbers for what you're going to be putting into the property. Because that's a big ticket. If you, uh, if you say, hey, you know, ha half of the money that we're raising to put towards CapEx is going to be deferred maintenance, but it's not really adding value to the property, that's a problem. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, that's a good point to bring up. And these last two questions are kind of like contrasting questions. The, the first question really is, what did you find that was easier during this process that maybe in the beginning you thought was going to be a little bit more challenging? You know, I thought raising the money would be harder, <laughs> to be honest with you. But what I found is this, I mean, so I'm a logistics guy. So, you know, some people like to just say, hey, we're going to go into a market. And let's just go find deals. Um, I'm more of like, hey, six months before we even go looking for deals in Kansas City or other markets we're, we're looking at, I'm going in there. I'm flying in. I'm getting the infrastructure, logistics systems, you know, property management companies, construction crews, all the logistics that you could possibly think of that you're going to go through when you're acquiring assets. I get all that set up in advance, right? All the legal structure, accounting structure, everything. So that way, once we're going in, like we can flip the light switch and rock and roll with it. So for me, uh, that allowed the money raising to be much easier because we have our ducks in a row and we're able to present ourselves as like, these guys know what they're doing and they're not like fly by night, first time, you know, show guys trying to raise some capital, you know, and have to figure things out, right? I, I don't want to make a lot of big money mistakes. I can make some small money mistakes and try and recover from those. Well, I think in your background in asset management also, you know, bodes well for your, your background and credibility and experience as well, which probably helped you on that capital raise side of things. Yeah. And coming from the construction industry, you know, literally since I've been like two years old, I mean, my dad had me on his job sites digging ditches while he's building apartment buildings just to teach us like the value of a dollar. And so having that construction background as a licensed general contractor and watching that and also being a part of my dad's stuff where he was doing two, 300 unit apartment buildings. So it, it's never been too big for me, if that makes sense. I mean, that's where I see us going, um, where people can get overwhelmed by that because they just haven't had that. Maybe if they were younger, didn't we weren't around it at all. Where I kind of was raised through it, even though it was from you know family side, um, it helped. It helped me understand it better, not get overwhelmed by it. So, so last question I have for you here, Justin, is what did you find that was harder? than originally you thought, than originally expected that maybe you thought originally was going to be a little bit easier? The, the, not so much the asset management side of it, but uh, the logistics of turning the units where, you know, you got 30 units, a hundred units, 200 units in a building and, you, and you're trying to schedule that. Right. But you don't want to, kick too many people out for you have high vacancy rates and then you run into a cash flow problem, but yet you want to turn over a certain number of units to keep things moving. And so manning it's, that's probably what I think is um, one of the more challenging processes of turning the units over and upgrading them is managing that turnover process to where you keep cash flows moving in the building. Don't piss off tenants too much, keep them there and manage that, that process. It's, it's hard. It's, it's a constant game, as I'm sure you know, 
and just trying to move and, 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 and dance. I was, I was like, you're, you're dancing. That's what you're yeah. doing. Now, I, I would definitely uh, second that one for sure. And I would also say that the other challenge is, like you said, keeping the, the other, the, the existing residents happy because you're having to do, you know, banging on the walls and, you know, renovations and things like that. But you got to do it during certain hours. You can't do it right. during some of the weekend hours because of the, the residents actually being home and disturbing them. And it can be a definite uh, challenge for sure. Yeah. And keeping them having the sense to where they, they know what's coming <laughs> because they know you're renovating units. And then they're online and they probably see what you're, I mean, everybody talks. Yep. <laughs> so they see, oh, prices are going up. Rents are going up. I'm next. And so you don't want them moving out too soon. Right. But you don't want, it's, it's a dance, you know? Yeah. Um, were, were all these units, were all these not units, but were all these residents on, uh, on contracts for like a certain period of time or were they month to month? Yeah, most are on contracts, thankfully. A uh, few are month to month. I, I've tried to, even on all the buildings that we've, we've purchased, I've tried to get them on um, more long-term contracts, even if it's for six months, nine months, 12 months. And then I'm, I'm, tr I'm working with a property management company because initially they had them all staggered. Where They're not staggered. They were not staggered where they were <laughs> six in a month. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And they're, they're like in January. It's like freezing. It's cold. Things don't rent in Kansas city in January. Yeah. So we had to then start to move those rent, those leases out to where they were staggered better. And then more importantly, coming up in the spring and fall between spring and fall. Right. And, and not dealing from basically mid November through now, pretty much I'd say end, end of February it's dead in terms of the rental market there. So you don't want to be sitting there with a bunch of vacant units. So we had to really work with those, those leases to turn them over. Well, Justin, I want to thank you for spending some time with us here this afternoon and going over this acquisition with us. I'd like for you to give us some, uh, 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 to give you a chance here to tell the listeners how they can reach you, how they can get a hold of you to ask you further questions about this uh, particular acquisition or um, possibly just follow you further. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we're online. You can Google my name, Justin Brennan, a bunch of stuff's going to pop up. You'll probably see some realtor stuff, but then, you know, the Brennan Poli group, Brennan Poli group.com. That's where our, um, our apartment company's at. Uh, we're on LinkedIn, all the major social channels were there. YouTube, we're pretty heavy on. So we're putting out a bunch of videos, more educational and informational stuff, um, more for our benefit, but then, you know, educating our investors and people around us that kind of have a bunch of Q and a questions who want to get into the space, but they're, they're scared, right? They just need to learn the process to either do it themselves or passively invest with someone they trust. So that's kind of the options out there. Yeah. Well, again, thank you so much for being here, Justin. It was a great interview and looking forward to continuing to follow you and uh, looking forward to having you on a, on, a, on a future episode as you continue to close more deals. Thank you. I love what you're doing, man. Keep up the multifamily seminars and everything you, you're putting on. I, I see your stuff out there. It's pretty exciting. So keep it up. Well, I appreciate it. And uh, until next time, I'll see you later. Thanks, Dan.